as you guys know firsthand, um, a significant amount of time and resources are invested into accurately establishing risks um, for the projects within our dam and levy inventories. Um, so our charge as risk analysts um, is to, to do this in a way that is defensible and easily understood um, by our decision makers. Um, because the primary objective of a risk assessment is to ultimately inform the decision of whether further action or investment is needed. Um, so our job this week is to um, help you guys further develop the tools um, and skills needed to portray, communicate, and defend um, the risk assessment results effectively. Um, so in addition to that, um, we have to understand how to use the results to develop and support recommendations um, and ultimately the, the decision of, of what are we going to do about it. Um, so in a nutshell, this is making the case. Um, and if, if we can't make the case, um, then we ultimately haven't completed the mission. Um, so all of the work and um, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into to getting to the risk results is for naught if we can't, um, you know, make the case to the decision makers. Um, so what will this course look like? All right, so each participant, as outlined in the participant email, each participant is expected to have read the assigned um, dam or, and levy project read ahead um, prior to the workshop. Um, so today, like I mentioned, we'll be review, reviewing um, general risk portrayal concepts. Um, and by the end of the day, you guys will be going into your designated virtual rooms um, to start working with your breakout groups. Um, and you guys will work together on um, developing the, the presentation um, for, I'll say, decision makers. In this case, it's going to be your peers um, that makes the case for your individual project risk. Um, so we've provided a presentation template for reference, um, and each participant will also individually write and submit their risk characterization summary. Um, and again, the risk characterization summary template is provided um, on the RMC website. And so we want all the participants to submit the risk characterization summary by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind while you're working with your groups over the next couple days that um, you also have this short kind of individual um, assignment. And it shouldn't take very long at all, um, you know, half hour to an hour. Um, of putting that together. Um, and so then the instructors um, will review and grade each individual summary and provide feedback back to you guys um, by day five. Um, and day five will have some time allotted in there that if you need to go back and make any adjustments, um, you'll have time to do that. And you'll notice in your participant workbook, um, there's a grading rubric toward the end, and that's what we as the instructors will kind of be using as a reference um, in grading the individual risk characterization summary. So that's part of the um, participation you know, grade is, is meeting the expectations that are outlined, the, outlined in the grading rubric. Okay, so day three, um, groups A, B, and C will take turns briefing the instructors and the other two groups. Um, so for example, group A will go first, and they'll be brief briefing groups B and C, and, um, and the instructors. Um, so the, the two groups that are not briefing will be voting and kind of serving that role of the decision makers. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of role playing um, this week. And you guys will be voting on the DSAC or LSAC um, determination the tolerability and the path forward um, for the other group. So um, just to clarify, groups D and E will not need to call in on day three, just groups A, B, and C. So then day four, um, groups A, B, and C will be off on day four. So they already went on day three. So group, day four, groups D and E will do the same thing. 
they'll brief to the instructors and the other group, and the group that's not briefing will vote on the DSAC or LSAC um, tolerability and pass forward. And then day five, we'll all gather back together in the main virtual room as we have today. Um, we'll, you'll, you guys will get a debrief from us on the group presentations from day three and four, and also on our observations from the risk characterization summaries um, that will be submitted um, by the end of the day tomorrow. And then we'll also have some time for questions and, and answers um, and just kind of talk through some of your all's observations um, from the week. And then we'll have, um, like I said, some time built in there to where you guys can go back and, and make adjustments to your individual risk summaries if needed. All right, so course credit. So the requirements to receive credit for the course, obviously we want to have 100% participation in each of the sessions. Um, I know it's, it's a virtual format, so it's tougher to kind of disconnect from the other stuff you have going on, but um, we, this is a really hands-on course. It was designed to be that way, so um, we, we need you guys to be engaged um, pretty much the, full, the whole time. Um, participation in the group presentations and a voting on the path forward for the other group projects. So, you know, to show that, that you guys are, um, you know, participating and engaged, that, that vote on, on the path forward and the DSAC and tolerability, that's going to kind of serve as your, um, you know, indication that, that you participated um, on those days and then your um, submittal of your risk characterization summary. Um, and we're looking for those to, to at least meet or exceed the expectations that are outlined in the, the rubric provided in the participant um, workbook. And there's, um, you know, sev there's a few different areas um, where we'll kind of be looking. Did we outline the performance and, and how that plays into the annualized probability of failure effectively? Um, did we capture the life loss? Um, did we capture the incremental life safety? Um, did we capture the uncertainty? And then the DSAC and LSAC recommendations. All right, any questions before we move into some of the, the general risk stuff? All right, so what is risk? Um, basically, you know, we, we all live with risk in all different areas of our lives. Um, and this just kind of shows a few um, of the different types of risk. Um, so our world is flood risk, but there's lots of different um, components to risk um, that, that lots of different industries um, deal with. All right, so as humans, we use risk in our everyday lives. Um, and, you know, the choices that we make directly impact um, what our risk is as an individual. Um, so this is just to kind of help put it in, in perspective a little more. Um, and everybody can, can look this up on Google, but a micromort is a unit of risk defined as one in a million chance of death. Um, so de depending on your specific circumstances, um, your level of risk is going to be different than the next person. Um, and a lot of different things go into that, your age, your lifestyle, um, and this just kind of shows how that factors in. So, you know, it's kind of similar for our projects. Um, you know, the age of the structure, the, um, you know, the, the circumstances and the loading that the, the project experiences um, all factors into to what the risk is for that system. So, um, although the definitions of risk vary slightly across, you know, different industries and organizations, um, the federal guidelines definition of risk is essentially the product of the likelihood of a structure being loaded, which is also referred to as, as the hazard, um, the likelihood of adverse structure performance given that the load occurs, 
Um, so that's your performance component. Um, and then the magnitude of the resulting consequences. And so this is essentially the risk equation. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can show what that equation looks like. Um, so this is more of a visual portrayal, portrayal of the equation. Um, and so you can see you know, from this that if any of these components is zero or very low risk, then the risk overall is zero um, for that, that project. Um, and you might have a couple situations where you have seemingly identical risk, um, but what is driving the risk can be extremely different. So for one scenario, it could be the consequences. For one scenario, it could be you know, the performance. Um, so you kind of have to, to dig into that to, to show really what's driving the risk. Um, so specifically for flood risk, um, there are three components. We have our dam or levee risk, which is also referred to as the incremental risk. Um, we have the, the background, or I'm sorry, the non-breach risk, um, which is also referred to as, as our background risk. And so those two combined is what makes our um, total risk, um, or in other words, flood risk. So essentially, um, you have you know the the incremental risk or the dam or levee risk um, that's posed by the potential poor performance of the dam or levee, um, and then the flood risk includes this as well as the risk of flooding um, from capacity exceedance. Um, in other words, your non-breach. So in terms of our tolerable risk concepts and and the decisions that we make for our dam and levee projects, these are going to be based on our dam or levee risk um, or that incremental risk. So just to help kind of keep it straight, because there's a lot of different terms that, that get thrown around. Um, so on the left here, we have our, our commonly used terms, and on the right, you know, some other terms that are a lot of times used interchangeably. Um, so this just helps me kind of keep straight what, what is what. Um, so you guys can reference back to this as needed. Um, but I guess a key component for dam and levee safety is that um, life safety is paramount. Um, so understanding the consequence piece of the equation is, is a critical component. Um, so the, the green area shown here is your non-breach inundation. Um, and that's the inundation that we would see you know, if the system funct functions as designed. Um, so you know, as it's supposed to. Um, and then the, the blue shaded area, um, the outside extents of that um, are your breach extents. And that's um, th that overlaps your non-breach, which is what would have flooded um, regardless of the performance of the structure. So what we're interested in it, what we're interested in is the incremental, um, which is the difference between the two. And that's where you can see the, um, the highlighted area there. Um, so that's the metric that we're going to use when, when making decisions. And um, in some cases, we also want to consider an economic and environmental considerations as well. But again, life safety is paramount. So the intent here um, with this slide is just to emphasize that without potential failure modes, we don't have a risk assessment. Um, we organize our risk assessments around the various potential failure modes that can occur. Um, so it's important to, to look at those considerations in a structured way um, and figure out what that chain of events is that leads to, to failure. OK, so moving into the risk equation. So here's our general risk equa equation um, for incremental risk. We have the probability of the loading, 
or the hazard, um, and then we have the probability of failure given the loading, or you know that's also your performance, and then we have the consequences given the failure. So that first component is essentially your annual exceedance probability um, of the hazard, and then your system response probability is that um, probability of, of failure given the loading. So ultimately, we're kind of getting to the same, same end result, um, regardless of what risk assessment method you use, whether it's QRA or SQRA. Um, those two components together create your annual probability of failure. And then you have your incremental consequences. So those three components of the equation are what comprises your average annual life loss. All right, so moving into the tolerable risk guidelines. So risk tolerability is essentially a judgment of the appropriateness of efforts to manage the risk at a given point in time. Um, so it's an aggregate of how well the four TRGs have been addressed. Um, we're asking ourselves, has the, the federal interest been managed through the right actions? Um, and what this really demonstrates is, is that it's not just a number we're after or a plotting position on a risk matrix. We, we want to look at all the different components and, and make sure we're doing the best we can to manage risks and reduce risks. Okay, so our tolerable risk guidelines. We have TRG1, um, which is what we, we were looking at a little bit earlier, um, where that's your, essentially your risk equation. Um, and we're looking at our risk commensurate with the benefits in this category. Um, TRG2, we are building risk awareness, uh, or we're looking at um, whether we're building risk awareness, and this evaluates whether risks are continually recognized and, and communicated. And then TRG3 um, is fulfilling daily responsibilities. This evaluates whether risks are being prop properly monitored and uh, managed. And then TRG4 is actions to reduce risk. Um, so this determines if they are cost-effective, um, socially acceptable, or environmentally acceptable ways to reduce risk. Um, so the next few slides, we're going to walk through each TRG and cover items um, the team will want to discuss with the decision makers as part of the, the case. Okay, so TRG1, understanding the risk. Um, here we're looking at our individual and societal risk thresholds. Um, we're looking at economic and non-monetary risks, um, exceptional circumstances, and um, we provide a tolerability assessment. So essentially, if risk thresholds are exceeded, TRG1 is generally not tolerable. Um, if they're not exceeded, then TRG1 um, is generally tolerable. So. There's some nuances between dams and levees that um, we'll get into in the next couple slides that, that need to be taken into account um, when we're, we're looking at TRG1. So specifically for dams, um, we're looking at our risk tolerable from an individual risk perspective and from a societal, societal perspective. So that's where it's, it's um, pretty cut and dry um, from that perspective. If we're above, then it's not below, um, then, then it is tolerable. Um, there are some circumstances where it's, it's more of a gray zone. Um, so, and that's your, what's, what we like to sometimes refer to as our unicorn box, um, where you have very low probability, high consequence um, scenarios or um, events. Um, and so, these have to be examined with more scrutiny um, and, and addressed with more rigor um, to determine have we done everything we can to sufficiently reduce risk. Um, we have to ask the question, are economic risks high enough to have a significant national impact? And are the um, non-monetary risks high enough to 
significantly threaten critical environmental, cultural, or historical resources? And then are there any exceptional circumstances? So this sometimes gets um, confused um, in, in how to, to look at this. Um, so when you say, um, when we're acting on behalf of society, um, we determine that life safety risks are tolerable based on benefits that the dam brings, even though the risk estimate um, would usually be considered unacceptable. Um, we have to, to look at, you know, have we done everything we can to reduce risk? And in, in some cases, if the answer is yes, um, and we've, we've met ALARP, then we might decide that um, those risks are tolerable. Okay, so for levies, um, again, very similar, but some nuances. Um, so the limits of tolerability are um, also informed by um, the inherent limitation imposed by the levy's height, and therefore use the least stringent um, when looking at, one, your levy performance with the mean overtopping frequency, um, and the levy risk with the non-breach risk, and then two, the levy risk with the standard individual and societal risk guidelines. Um, so that's kind of outlined here where um, for your, your societal perspective, you wanna be an order of magnitude um, below that average annual life loss for your non-breach. Um, and then same, same questions we wanna look at for our economic and non-monetary risks. So building risk and awareness. Um, for this one, and to be tolerable, we have to show that um, USACE is completely aware of risks and that risks have been communicated to the affected population and stakeholders. Um, and we wanna provide examples of um, public outreach. You know, have we done our tabletop exercises? What kind of social media outlets are we utilizing to um, communicate to the public? Um, things like that. Um, so our outreach to just the EMAs is not sufficient to meet TRG2. We, we wanna actually reach the public um, or evaluate whether the, the public is, has been um, communicated with. Okay, and then TRG3 is fulfilling daily responsibilities. So here we look at our dam safety scorecard um, and why you know points were missed um, and discuss planned efforts to improve these areas. Um, we look at um, previous use safe levy inspection reports and and any you know routine inspections that we've had. Um, um, our monitoring plan and then the status of the, the current um, EAP. And then for TRG4, we're looking at actions to reduce with risk. Um, so have cost-effective, socially acceptable, or environmentally acceptable ways to reduce risk been identified and implement, implemented? Um, so, you know, what are those actions that we've taken to manage and reduce risk? Um, where are IRMs at? Um, are they current? Have we completed all of them? Um, and then the, you know, the culture of the day-to-day -day personnel and those completing um, periodic activities, um, things like that. So moving Barbara, into, quick, yes. Quick question. This is Damien, sorry to interrupt you. No, what, yeah, go ahead. What do you think, um, like, uh, what's the sense of whether or not TRGs two, three, and four are semi-dependent on TRG one being like higher or low? So that, for an example, so if uh, let's say TRG1 is re relatively low uh, for a levy, for example, you think it's important that a sponsor does all the, you know, the work like educating the public about the risk, even though it might be relatively low? Yes, I think, you know, it's still critical that, that those components of the TRG are given as much priority, um, even though it might be a lower risk project. So I don't know that it, it necessarily, you know, 
lightens the the stringent or the um, the urgency of of meeting those TRGs. If that makes sense. Carmen, it's t it's Tim, if I may. The I think TRG two and three are relatively independent of TRG one, but I think TRG four may have some more dependency on TRG one as far as identifying additional actions when the risks are low. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense necessarily. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other questions? Okay, so just want to cover a couple things on making recommendations. Um, essentially, when we go to make recommendations, we're looking at a few different components. So one component is our risk characterization. So that's your DSAC and your LSAC um, determination. Um, second is your risk management actions. And this is, these are typically your recommendations. So what things do we need to do to reduce risk or you know, further study, um, kind of your path forward, um, essentially. And then the other component that's more specifically applicable to levies is the National Flood Insurance Protection Accreditation Determination. Um, so in terms of your safety action classification, um, this is driven, you know, primarily by your, your risk estimates. Um, and so this is where we are comparing projects within the portfolio um, from a life safety perspective and, and classifying each project accordingly. Um, and it, it's what helps us um, prioritize our resources. So it is more of an internal um, tool that is used um, to kind of help prioritize um, funding and, and resources to where it's needed most. Um, but it is a, a component that um, the decision makers have to to ultimately, you know, make that determination. Um, but the teams help inform that, and so knowing what the team's recommendation is of what that should be is is very helpful to the decision makers. Um, so they you know again they're they're driven by life safety but um they it, we also want to recognize economic and environmental considerations if applicable um so they're it's based on our incremental risk um but what we don't want to do is um make the DSAC and LSAC a surrogate for likelihood of failure so it's not it's also not a surrogate for urgency of action um, and then non-breach risk is, is not, does not factor into our DSAC and LSAC um, classifications. And as our essential use safe guidelines um, shouldn't be um, used to inform DSAC and LSAC. And um, tolerability is, is a separate thing also. Um, so when we go to, to look at what the the classification should be, we kind of look at, you know, what are other dams or, or levies within the portfolio? Where are they plotting? And what are those trends? Um, and that helps provide kind of a gut check of what what the appropriate um, DSAC or, or LSAC classification should be. For risk management actions, um, we want to focus these on risk drivers. And, and they should be recommendations that we expect to take action on. So, you know, not necessarily the nice to have, you know, everything in, in the kitchen sink, but um, what, what, which ones are, are really critical that, um, that they happen to um, manage the risk of the project. Um, and they should be formulated around the four tolerable risk guidelines. Um, and placed in order of urgency or priority. Um, so, you know, most urgent recommendation should naturally be listed first. Um, we want to identify the responsible party, whether that's USACE or the sponsor or both, um, and just, you know, organize it in a, in a um, consistent fashion. So provide the number, the risk driving PFM that's applicable, the applicable TRG, and a brief rationale for why the, the recommendation is needed. 
And so for our levies for um, the NFIP um, evaluation, this is where we um, calculate the annual, the mean annual probability of inundation, or the API. Um, and this is essentially the APF for the prior to overtopping PFMs. Why is this a fancy? Um, combined with the annual exceedance probability of overtopping. Um, and the guidance on this is, is being kind of like further developed as we speak, um, but there is an ECB out there that explains how to do this. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, um, but just know that you know this is an, a consideration that we have to to um, to look at when we're we're doing risk assessments on levies. So in summary, um, again, the purpose of this course is that we have to be able to effectively portray, communicate, and defend um, the results of our risk assessments. Um, otherwise, our, all the hard work that goes into completing the risk assessment is, um, is you know, lost, um, and we can't accomplish our mission as risk analysts. So our goal is to um, you know, be rock stars at, at making the case. Um, the risk equation is the probability of adverse consequences. Um, so again, it's it's the the um, probability of failure given the load and the consequences, and that combined with the probability probability of the load itself um, is your your risk. Um, so another definition is it's a measure of the probability and severity of adverse effects. And then um, some guidelines in evaluating tolerability. Um, we make, as you say, we make risk-informed decisions with the goal of meeting all four TRG. Um, each TRG is considered individually and collectively, um, and so there's no prescriptive criteria to each TRG. Um, we have, there's, there is some overlap between, um, between the TRGs. Um, we make a tolerability evaluation based on, on the, the considerations described in the previous slides and in combination with the, the risk assessment data and, um, and evidence. Um, and risk can, can be considered tolerable by identifying and making progress toward risk management recommendations or by determining that no further risk reduction is justifiable. And then risk would be considered unacceptable if no progress or action is being planned or accomplished. Okay, so making recommendations. Um, these are gonna be informed by your risk assessment results. And they, at a minimum, include your risk characterization, your risk management actions, and the NFIP accreditation um, determination for levies. Any questions on kind of general risk overview stuff, um, tolerability, making recommendations? Adam is going to go into a little bit more detail on that um, in the making the case module, um, but just wanted to kind of touch on those general concepts to set the stage a little bit. So Carmen, I've got a question for the group, is there a scenario? And put your, go ahead and put your answers in the chat box. You can put a yes or a no. Is there a scenario where a project could be tolerable when one of the individual TRGs is not technically met? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of yeses pop up. Does anyone feel brave enough to Describe a scenario where that could be the case. Damien, were you going to give an explanation or not? If not, I'm going to call on somebody. <laughs> oh, I was I was going to type it, but uh, I was just going to say if, if the uh, benefits that you know, like a uh, a large dam or something provides, are really really high, society might deal with uh, high risk. 
is Amanda. I think I've seen one that Tim has presented where the levy system was in um, really good shape, really well maintained, but had really high overall risk. So TRG1 wasn't met, the TRGs two through four were. I think they considered that tolerable. Yeah, that's a good example. And Calvin and, uh, and Megan also gave some good examples in the chat. Yeah, so it really comes down to not only do we have a good understanding of the risk, but if we have a project whose total risk is high and we've determined that there are no cost-effective ways to reduce that risk, then in that case, like Damien said, if we deem that the benefits that the dam provides are greater than the risks and there are no cost-effective ways, and we document that there are no cost-effective ways to reduce the risk to a tolerable level, then, yeah, we can, we can say that a project is tolerable even if it doesn't meet the tolerability thresholds from, say, TRG1. Okay, thanks for the discussion. Wanted to get the pump prime, get you guys talking. That's good. Yeah, Jason mentioned an example where we might have low risk, but we aren't up to date on our EAP exercises, or, you know, maybe risk communication isn't what it should be. Would that be considered tolerable? Yeah. And I also put in there. Go ahead, Jason. I was just going to say, I also put it in there, but, it, but it's planned to try to make up, so maybe they're not meeting TRG2 right now as it stands, point in time. But uh, but I think there has been decisions where it's been made based on uh, out, you know, planned activities that uh, it's tolerable. Go ahead, Damon. Oh, I was just going to ask um, if, if those examples – like Adam was saying, are, are those uh, highlighted on the DSAC LSAC chart so you can kind of see which ones uh, fall out of the norm because of whatever reason? I don't I don't remember if that's actually a thing. Uh, no, I don't think that those are going to be highlighted on our DSAC LSAC charts, Damien, because we separate tolerability from DSAC and LSAC. So. I don't think that those were. I don't think that that's something that we would put on the. Yeah. The portfolio plot, per se. Yeah, kind of Thanks. Like Adam said, you've got to divorce the DSAC LSAC evaluation from the tolerability evaluation. Uh, DSAC LSAC, quite simply, is just level of incremental risk. Tolerability is a measure of how we're doing as an owner and managing that risk for the most part. They're, they're separate evaluations, and just need to divorce those two. Tim, could you say or just give an example why some of the dams fall outside of where, like, a normal DSAC-3 falls for all those plots, why some fall above or below? What's an example of why that happens? Well, it's, it's not a black and white criterion. I guess you're talking specifically about uh, societal risk guideline on TRG-1. Um, yeah. So you can see the the mean there of, of all DSEC-3s. It's pretty much right on that line. Then there's some... There is some subjectivity in there, and there's a document out there that that SOG uses to adjust uh, these sacks up and down. Remember, three three is still a moderate risk. So, Damien, some examples could be when, if you recall from Carmen's TRG one slide, you might have a project with a level of incremental life safety risk that plots near. Um, so, for example, if we look at the the, oh, yeah, the the orange box that's right around the DSEC 1 line, close to 10,000 life loss, I'm not sure what project that is, I'm just using it as an example, but 
there may be a case where you have a you know relatively low life safety risk or well that's not going to be a good a good example but if you could have instances where your your life safety risk is relatively low but you have very high perhaps environmental or cultural risks that DSOG considers outside of the life safety risk that that serve to increase the the DSAC over what you would see in the in the the average lines in the prioritization chart. There's just there, there's those other factors for for TRG one that do get considered when you're looking at DSAC and LSAC outside of life safety. So that can cause some of that span as well. I'd also and Tim has more experience on DSOG than I do, but I would uh, I would venture a guess to say that some of the DSAC four points that we see down in the DSAC five range were categorized before we really started getting into the DSAC-5 categorizations. So if looked at today, perhaps we'd see a lot more green circles instead of yellow circles in that zone. So it might be a little misleading just because of how we put this plot together over time and how our, our procedure for classifying projects has, has evolved over that time span. Okay. Thanks. Another consideration, and we'll talk about this in the next module, is there's, you know, you're looking, what we're plotting here is your total risk. So, you know, the total risk is made up of components of the of the different failure modes and how those different failure modes break out. There may be a, there may be a case to be made that the, the total risk is, you know, the, it may, might be more tolerable from a um, AALL perspective than it would be if you just looked at the total and if you looked at the individuals instead of the total. But we I've got an example on that in the next presentation we can we'll talk through. There was also a question in the chat of if um the presentations will be available. Um and yes, we will be providing those and they should be loaded up to the RMC website by the end of the day today.